Yeah. Hey, Kevin. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah. uh, hi, my name is Kevin Hill, and uh, my talk today is on behavioral computing or uh, building tools to align our decisions with our goals. So yeah, a little bit about me. Uh, I've just had a transition. Uh, I was up with Pebble, the people who make smart smartwatches, up until a week ago Friday. And I just had an amazing opportunity to join a new team in the social e-commerce space, Looplist, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, obviously, it's a little less relevant to, my, uh, to this conference, so I'll be focusing on mostly on the work that I've done with Pebble and wearables, and uh, a lot on how I think there's a, a lot of commonalities between a lot of the things I've seen here today and a lot of things people are doing that I think are strongly tied to these basic biological factors that we have to deal with. And, uh, hopefully provide a little bit of insight on how the, to uh, scale these things in a more efficient way. So what do I mean by behavioral computing? This is a picture of B.F. Skinner and his daughter uh, and a, the air crib that he built for her in the early 1940s. Uh, Skinner, of course, is the famous uh, psychologist and behaviorist um, who you might know from Skinner Boxes. He was one of the first uh, real interesting applications of trying to understand the mathematical and structured relationship between inputs and an animal's behavior. So in a Skinner box, right, you control all the inputs and see the impacts on mostly rats' behavior. Um, and, but really, the, what you're seeing here is not nearly quite so cruel as you might think at, at first blush. Really, this air crib he built to take that same core knowledge that he, under, that he had from his scientific work on the relationship between inputs and behaviors and try to help his daughter sleep at night. So he would adjust the air temperature in the crib by just a degree or two every night and see how well she slept uh, and what her behavior patterns were like. <clears throat> and so I think this, this is sort of a very early uh, attempt at, at what a lot of us are doing right now, which is trying to optimize human behavior using computational methods. And I think the group that really took uh, this type of outlook on life, the farthest in, in the intervening decades between then and now, has been uh, behavioral economists. And one of the most interesting findings, I think, from the recent work that they've done is that they're learning that behavior is extremely contextually dependent. And I'll, I'll use an example, my favorite example, uh, this Hellerstein et al. paper from 2013 uh, that studied European farmers. So as any economist knows, you can take uh, farming decisions in the field, when you plant, what you plant, how much of one crop versus another, and basically model these as risk and reward choices. And we also have these great lab-based uh, <coughs> tests for risk aversion, risk preference. So they wanted to see if taking these farmers outside of their daily life, putting them into a lab, would allow them to predict what their farming choices were going to be in the following season. And it turns out that the prediction was very weak. Uh, and kind of the, the um, agreement that the field has settled on is that this means that behavior is really contextually dependent, that the context of the lab changes something uh, when you change it to the context of the field. So one way of looking at this is that when the context shifts, your goals might stay the same, but you enter it into a very different decision process. So on the left here, we've got an image of a dirt road in, a, in the woods. And on the right, we've got a picture of a highway in the city. And in both contexts, the goal is the same. You want to get from point A to point B safely and quickly. But the decisions that you're going to be faced with and the behavior that results is going to be quite different. And th this is a really good, adaptive, strong um, uh, mechanism for organisms in the real world. As anyone who's ever been in a car where uh, the driver has attempted to drive like a highway when they're on a dirt road knows, it, we want behavior not to be some sort of frozen set of, of actions that we take, but something that's dynamic and that's able to adjust to the circumstances that we're presented with. If we take that definition of context and flip it on its head, we actually get a pretty good distinction between goals and decisions. Our goals are something that have very long time courses. They, they slowly bias behavior over very long time courses. My goals yesterday are the same as my goals today, and hopefully they'll be my same as my goals tomorrow. Decisions, on the other hand, are very short time course events, right? It's 
how do I make this decision right now in 100 milliseconds? And I think that these images here sort of exemplify what our goal and decision systems look like. This man on the left is obviously very goal-driven. Uh, he has dedicated a significant amount of his period of his time uh, over many, many months, um, to, or maybe even years, to excelling at a particular task. He's making very minute adjustments in his knees, his hips, his back, his shoulders, all to both prevent injury and to try to maximize the amount of force that he can exert on the weight pressing up. On the other side, we've got a pretty delicious looking cupcake that doesn't really take you very long to, to think about or to plan what you're gonna do with that cupcake. So what do we know about the neurobiology of these two systems? Uh, <laughs> I have a pet peeve uh, where I really don't like when people um, take the complex field of neuroscience, which is really about patterns and structures and networks and timing, and boil it down to basically phrenology, where you say this happens here and that happens there. But I have eight minutes and 55 seconds left, so I'm gonna do that right now, unfortunately. Uh, so, but we know that uh, a large amount of the goal-directed behaviors are uh, primarily processed in the prefrontal cortex, where the, uh, the neural activity that drives our moment-to-moment -moment decisions is more strongly driven by the midbrain. <clears throat> now, even just knowing that these are two si separate systems, we know uh, that, that gives us a good idea that we can find times when these systems aren't in perfect alignment, right? As anyone who, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room wants to be stronger, faster, smarter, and better, right? But obviously, not all of our moment-to-moment dec -moment decisions line up with those long-term goals. If we've ever eaten a little bit too much food, drank a little too much alcohol, watched too much Netflix at night, we know that these systems can come into conflict. And I think really a good way to put what a lot of us are doing in this field is trying to bring those two systems into alignment so that we can make our moment-to-moment -moment decisions, whether they're health decisions or uh, consciousness decisions or awareness, to be in line with our long-term goals. So if I, if I really did have the time to go into digression, this is the uh, direction I'd, I'd take you in the latest of neuroscience. If anyone else has time, I highly recommend looking up the work of David Reddish at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this is a figure from his most, well, not most recent paper, but a, a recent paper uh, where he has recorded multiple neurons from the uh, medial prefrontal cortex and looked for patterns of activity that describe and predict latent behavioral strategies. They can also take these, these rats and put them through into a new behavioral context and see their behavior shift over time. And the really interesting stuff is that you can see that these neural signals for behavioral strategies change in uh, much, much earlier than the behavior does. In addition, uh, and actually predict that future behavior change. Um, in addition, he's done some really interesting work on model-free versus model-based learning. And I think that this has some really good, interesting practical implications for development of AI systems. Uh, and ones that are effective inside the real world. <clears throat> so but what all of these sort of findings from neuroscience and findings from biology are, are showing us is that there are these surprisingly conserved uh, mechanisms and requirements for learning. And that really all of these behavior change problems are learning problems. So on the left here, we've got a C. elegans worm. This is a worm about a millimeter long and it eats primarily E. coli. So it's one about the simplest organisms you can possibly imagine, and yet it shows robust and interesting learning behaviors. And really, you'll need a couple of very simple, straightforward criteria for the worm to learn. You need the worm to be able to perceive uh, some data or information that will predict a outcome, <clears throat> then the worm will engage in behaviors that attempt to modify that outcome. And then if it receives feedback that that behavioral strategy is successful, the behavior will persist and the, the worm will have, uh, have been said to have learned. So these three basic things for a very simple worm are shockingly similar to the most sophisticated techniques we have for cognitive behavioral therapy, smoking cessation, uh, combating alcoholism, uh, alcoholism and depression. 
really, at, at that stage, it's really about identifying the, the barriers that are preventing you from uh, achieving a goal, de designing behavioral strategies that allow you to overcome that goal, and then looking if those behavioral strategies were successful and iterating until that goal is reached. So when you start thinking about what our problem is, it's really to take these very conserved and very basic uh, requirements and, and structures of, of changing behavior and learning and scale them to millions of people. And really, I think, and this is definitely a little bit of a plug for wearables in general and, and Pebble in particular, uh, but I think wearables are really the answer. When you imagine what's a system that can fulfill those requirements that I just laid out, almost always wearables are going to be a good part of that, that process. Our die, whore, die, our die hard Pebble users wear Pebbles 24 hours a day. They wear them while sleeping, while exercising, while in the shower. And that allows a robust and um, high quality of data that you just can't get through any other electronic medium. Anyone who has a cell phone knows that sometimes it's in their pocket, sometimes it's in their hands, sometimes it's on the table, sometimes they don't know where it is. At the same time, these wearables are becoming outfitted with more and more sophisticated biometric sensors, as you all know. Uh, the latest Pebble has both accelerometer and heart rate measurements in it. And uh, we've seen people experimenting with uh, you know, everything from a stick-on patch that stays on the body to galvanic skin response. And the, the quality and amount of data we're getting is, is exploding exponentially. At the same time, one of the most, the earliest adopted feature in Pebble is a feedback loop to you from the rest of the world. It's your notifications, it's the sports scores, it's the weather. So we have those two missing, we have those two sides of what I just described pretty well worked out. The, the output from you to a system and the potential input back from that system to you. And what we are really missing right now is just that intervention loop. What's the intervention that I'm gonna do that, that takes that prediction and changes it? And I think when you look at the business problems that we're faced with today in, in, in scaling this out and, and making these uh, dreams a reality, it's not, it's not as hard to add a new sensor as it is to build an organization that can take in that data in a iterative and creative way, come up with interventions, test those quickly, and continue that cycle. And I really think that when someone does finally crack that nut, that it's gonna be applicable much more widely than anyone, or at least most people, expect. So I think this is just the beginning of this conversation. I thank Lee for, for bringing us all here together and, and starting it. Uh, and I'd love to continue this conversation with all of you in the future. Uh, you can see my Twitter and, and LinkedIn profiles, and there's also a QR code you can use to download this talk and uh, actually even comment on the the slides directly. Hey, so we have time for three questions, approximately, depending on how long you take to ask the question. Any questions for Kevin here? I know it's a break, but... Maybe this. Thank you, Kevin. When you look at the wearable space, and there's so many things that are exciting about how it's coming together, what are the biggest weaknesses for wearables? In other words, they, they seem to be in search of something to actually track. Yeah, well, I think it's exactly what you said. It's the, the focus is on tracking, right? Tracking is a, tracking is a metric. Tracking is the beginning of the problem. Um, it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing to, sh to show how many steps you've had today. But the important thing is not just that number, but understanding that there's a certain trajectory of behavior that's gonna to lead to you being successful or not in the long term, and a, a strong focus on what can I do to, to modify that trajectory. Um, and so yeah, I'd, I'd say it's, it's an overemphasis on metrics and not enough on intervention. Okay, no more questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good.